You are listening to the IFH Podcast Network. For more amazing filmmaking and screenwriting podcasts, just go to ifhpodcastnetwork.com. Welcome to the Successful Screenwriter Podcast, where we discuss anything and everything screenwriting. Here we interview successful screenwriters and filmmakers to find out just what it takes to make it in the industry. Real quick before we get started, I wanted to mention that we are celebrating our one year anniversary of the Successful Screenwriter Podcast with a huge giveaway. This is awesome. We have a ton of prizes for you from mentorships to swag and you can enter it absolutely for free all you have to do is visit the successful screenwriter facebook page and click on the giveaway tab or go to the successful screenwriter.com slash podcast now you can enter multiple times too but keep an ear out this episode for the secret code which you can get five free entries with i am super excited about this week's guest It is Amy DeBoff, who is a Nebula Award-nominated science fiction author, and she has some great advice for you. Now, let's get to the show. All right, welcome to the podcast. I have on a super cool guest today, Amy DeBoff. She's a USA Today bestseller and a Nebula-nominated novelist for the second book in the Dark Star Trilogy, correct? Yes, A Light in the Dark. All right, very cool. And you also have a Catacle series, which is like an expanded universe. You've got your own MCU going, right? I do, I do. I have, I think, about half a dozen people working with me at, at projects in various stages now. And I'm very excited to be here and chat with you. That's uh, so cool. I actually want to talk about that later on, because I think it's quite brilliant to take your, your novel novels into that into that direction but before we get into that i wanted to bring somebody on to talk about science fiction i know you've done a little bit of screenwriting as well um science fiction is such a tricky genre to kind of get into so i thought we could talk about that for a little bit and i also be when we start out the show i like to get my guest's origin story Mm -hmm. you ready i i guess i guess i'm gonna find out now well i do you want me to just dive in with with my my uh, my early love of science fiction and how I got I, into writing? I am sitting here with bated breath. All right. Well, I think I was more or less born into the I am going to love sci-fi. My parents would watch Star Trek when I was little, and I I got into to that exposure very early on okay which star trek i mean if we're going there next generation next okay next gen were you i was a ds9 fan see i have seen bits and pieces of ds9 and i really do want to go back and watch it in its entirety at the time that it was airing i think i was a bit young and i didn't oh yeah yeah. that kind the the more political yeah and psychological side of it so i love that stuff now but i think at the time it didn't really grab me but i do want to go back and watch it and my husband yeah. and i've actually talked about doing that in the very near future there's a lot of nuance with it all right so you're so you're next gen started you grew up with next gen that's yeah, awesome so next gen and then on the more children's literature side i think the wrinkle in time series would be the first one that i read that would be in that kind of sci-fi vein it's it's definitely fantasy right not a fantasy thing but it, but it blurs into that sci-fi i think my first real sci-fi book was ender's game and i read that and i want to say fourth grade which is probably a little bit younger than what should be reading that <laughs> book but i just absolutely fell in love with it and uh, within a couple years after that, read Dune for the first time and wow. just fell in love with the massive thing. Sliders was my first real obsession. That was also around fourth grade. Nobody and knows I, that show, but Jerry, yeah. o, Jerry O'Connell, ladies and gentlemen. Yep. Yep. Solid. Yeah, so that was, that was my first fandom obsession and actually served as the inspiration for the Catacle series in some ways, I was really super dissatisfied with the ending of it and the, uh, that two of the main characters never got together as a, as a love <laughs> thing. And so I sort of had my own little fanfic going in my head and that eventually evolved into a completely different storyline and completely different universe. But, um, but yeah, the, the character of, of Chris and Kate were originally um, oh, cool. went in, wait, in the very early iterations so that led you to um you know 
taking the the bold move of of writing a novel, mm-hmm. right? And how long did it take you to really start getting into creating science fiction? So I started on my first writing project also in fourth grade. Apparently that was a huge year for me. And that was sort of more of like a sci-fi fantasy, like portal kind of thing that I got maybe like five chapters into and then abandoned. But um, around the time I was 10 or 11, I started thinking about what eventually became the Catacol universe. And by the time I was in sixth or seventh grade, I had actually started writing narrative for that. And I worked on that all the way up through middle and high school. And I was very fortunate to go to the Vancouver School of Arts and Academics in Vancouver, Washington, which was part of the Vancouver public school system, but it was an arts magnet program. And as part of that, I was able to have a literary arts special project for my junior and senior year. So I basically had one period where I was able to just sit in the hall and write for the entire time and had a a teacher supervising the the work that I was producing out of it. But so through that, I had all of part, what was supposed to be part one of a two part novel. Yeah. By the time I had finished that, I realized, I don't know, that's actually going to be just that. I, uh, so throughout college, I began expanding that and I was like, okay, well, I'll do it as a trilogy. Yeah. And then that trilogy eventually became seven volumes. And that is Catacol or is that? Um... Yes. So so the original bit that was created is now the book Veil of Reality, which is the volume two in there. So the first three volumes oh, are in this massive good. tome thing that is now titled Rumors of War. Look at that. But uh, so the middle bit of this book is where I started and I realized I needed a prequel to set things up. And then I went and did the, uh, the follow on books to that that. Just, just so the audience, the listeners know what series we're talking about, can you kind of give me just a brief log line of what this series is about? So this series is about a young man who is a the, the chosen one. He's been genetically engineered to uh, have very enhanced telekinetic abilities okay. to stop a war that has been going on for many, many generations. Okay. Is this a younger man? Uh, so the, the interesting thing about the series is that it takes place over about 60 years. So it's a multi-generational epic. Wow. Did you have 60 years? Mm-hmm. So, so awesome. the prequel is actually just about his father and mother meeting, basically. Okay. Um, and then book two picks up when he's 14. And by the end of the series, he's in his mid-40s and has kids of his own. Oh, that's amazing. I love generational types of stories like when i look at um this isn't science fiction but when i look at like the viking show Mm -hmm. it's very generational with with ragnar and then his kids and then where it's going to go from there um i love being able to follow a bloodline like that i mean even star wars to an effect is is Mm -hmm. generational so i think it is super cool to kind of see the sins of the father type of thing and how Mm -hmm. it can can follow through do you have um, a specific theme that you explore throughout each book or is there an overall theme that you like to kind of play around with in your writing? Uh, definitely one of the themes in this particular series is the danger of othering and what can happen if you just take one group and make them the enemy and how they can then become the real enemy and, and a really big threat. So one of the, the ongoing arcs in here is uh, about a- attacking the uh, the real evil leaders and not, and, and right. you have to, you have to deal with, with the threats that you're given, but being able to go back and, um, and, and look at a way to create peace and, and harmony and, and bring people back. Together. Wow. That is a powerful theme to really kind of discuss and dissect throughout a novel because othering, and if people don't know what othering is, I mean, it's, it's something that the, the Nazis used on, on the Jews. I mean, you create a, a, a swath of, of your citizenship that you deem as the others and you use as an enemy of the people, and then you persecute them. Um, and this is something that is going on today in, in, in various cultures, and some can even argue in the United States. So othering is dangerous and what i love about science fiction and what you're intelligently doing here is that you are commenting on social 
and social and probably I'm going to assume economical issues as well mm -hmm. um, through science fiction, because science fiction is a safe medium to be able to do that. Yeah. Um, if you do it in a drama, people spot it right away and it doesn't really sell. But if you can capture people in a fantastical world and mm -hmm. then humanize it, you can really start exploring those social issues. That's wonderful. Yeah. And one of the other big things that dovetails in with that is the idea that those in a position of power need to step up and actually be the those driving change because it. The, the, I mean, little little people doing oh. things is, is one thing, but if those people that are in the position of influence actually step up and do the right thing, really good, amazing things can happen. So what I hear you talking about right now is like a complete is like a political complacency, which is something that we are definitely been dealing with in mm -hmm. the U.S., where people get into power initially, well, hopefully initially to help others right but then they end up being stuck in the trappings of power and they yep. make sacrifices for the other people just for their own political security which is a huge problem so this is something that you're actually discussing in the book yeah i mean it's, it's, oh that's it's amazing the, the big the big themes in there yeah you know what's, and especially you, in the sequel series too i i will say that um that so i so fi this finishes up with uh so first there's the war arc and then there's the priesthood arc and so after that where um the Terran Empire saga picks up about five years later. And so there's a, a lot of the um, aftermath political dealings in there of like, well, we've gotten rid of the, this one big organization that was yeah. sort of running things in a super corrupt way, but how do we prevent ourselves from likewise? Oh, that's corrupt? awesome. That sounds really exciting. I would, I would, I could see why this is, this is being adapted into a TV show. Um, because it sounds like there's a lot of intrigue. I, I love political thrillers. A lot of people will, I don't know if you're a Star Wars fan or if you of enjoy course. them. Okay. So a lot of people will will say, oh, a Phantom Menace is terrible, right? And they'll and they'll they'll critique it. My re, my insight into that is that they're looking at it the wrong way. They're they're looking at Star Wars, a Phantom Menace, and they're expecting a Star Wars movie. But what they don't understand is that George Lucas was in his late fifties or sixties when he was making that. He made a political thriller. He made a political thriller that happens yeah. to have lightsabers, you know, because that's what interested him. So if you look at the film from a political thriller aspect, it all makes mm -hmm. sense on what's happening. You go, oh, OK. But nobody wanted to see that. And then he threw in yeah. a Jar Jar for no reason. <laughs> and things kind of spiraled out of control. But I think that is so cool. You have such it sounds like you have such a rich uh, universe. Now, when it comes to designing science fiction mm -hmm. one of the things that i teach with with students is you want to develop like a mythology religion and technology um even languages you know conlangs or something that they use like constructed languages they use in television not necessarily you need them in books but you can is i mean how long, how long or what was the process that you were using to create these new cultures basically i I think because I started on this project so young, I maybe went about it in a somewhat odd way. I, to, to be perfectly honest, I had mapped out these characters' lives over that multi-generational storyline. Wow. Before I really had it structured as like, this is going to be you know, a, a five book series or anything. I, I just, I, I just kind of had like, this is how things are going to go. So as I thought about those characters and the lives that they're going to be living I then built the world around so so if this is what's going on then what else would that be impacting yeah so as I as I worked on this year I, I had a lot of stuff that was in the back of my head and, yeah. it, and then as it became relevant to those lives in that arc I was telling I would flesh out the details as needed uh, but it, that all changed when I started bringing on the co-authors because then they were dealing with these other corners of the universe that I had just vague ideas in, in my head, but they were going to be writing very intensively in that. So, right. like, okay, so now we do have all of these other outer colony worlds. They're not really going to be following the same level of influences to area. So what are we going to do? So that's where writing a series Bible came in. And I, I just had to sit down and document a lot of things like, okay, so we're actually going to talk about how do the 
uh, the jump drives work yeah. or like, or, or who's in charge of this specific aspect of the, of the culture and like, what are prisons? And cause I, that had yeah. never come up before. It's like, how yeah. do they handle incarceration? Wow. That's amazing. I think it's brilliant to start with the character because um, you have the concept, you have the theme. So character really then becomes the soul of the story, right? Mm -hmm. So by mapping out multi-generational um, arcs, basically, of your character, you were setting yourself up for long-form storytelling, mm -hmm. which is like writing for television, really. I mean, yeah. you're, you're, you're creating a, a long arc. And doing that since you were a kid, to me, is amazing. Because I don't know many writers out there who think that way. I know a lot of writers will will think, okay, I'm going to write this book and I'm going to explore this book because this mm -hmm. book is kind of burning in me and I need to get that out there. And then if it's a hit, they go, okay, where do I go? I love the fact that you plotted it all out and then you left it just open enough for you to really explore. And I think that is something that anybody who's looking to kind of create their own universe, they can take, mm -hmm. that, take, a, take that as a great way to do it. Yeah, I mean, I, I would say for anyone who has that idea that they're kind of thinking about, what I would do is spend all of my bus commutes when I, I, I lived out just a little bit outside the city and then worked in downtown. So I, I would bus commute in because that was the, the best way to do it. So I'd spend that 40 minutes just sitting and running through conversations uh, between the characters in my head. And it would yeah. be stuff that would be completely not in the book at all. I mean, I could even have them in the real world. But it's like, okay, so if they were to be hanging out at just a regular barbecue uh, in you know, a backyard <laughs> suburban environment. Like, Space how would these barbecue. That's awesome. I love it. So do you find yourself in the trappings of having a super a supporting character who is almost uh, too likable or too interesting or makes the central character of the book a little less interesting where then you might have to pull back the supporting character or rework them a bit or or make them shine even more and give them their own book i i think my cast is fairly well balanced um i my my central characters if anything tend to be somewhat overpowered so it's more i think my bigger issue is finding supporting characters who can actually augment them and provide the right kind of support because right. that the, the worry is that there's this one person who can be just good at everything so yeah um which obviously is not really realistic and also doesn't make for a very interesting story so so just working in the the way to keep everyone working together and and have that team feel because I, I definitely want all of the books to have the the ongoing theme that we are stronger together than than alone no i like that i think that's good i like to have a supporting character who is interesting and dynamic in a different way from the central character mm -hmm. and has a skill set that the central character doesn't necessarily have yeah um and then i know greg Hurwitz once told me he said um have them needle the central character about that and i thought that's a great idea right so they can be arrogant and kind of and and i think of like i don't know did you see the new zombie movie with Zack snyder um, yeah. Army of the Dead. So there's a character in that who is um, a rather um, dramatic safe cracker, and he lets everybody know how good he is. And I think that's nice. that's kind of like a great fun uh, character to have, even though he can't shoot a gun or anything like that. Yeah, yeah. I certainly like having the comic relief side characters. I I do tend to have more serious uh, main POV character, so I need to have some. Yeah. Uh, some of that levity in there and and that often comes from the side relationships so you you talked about um one of the, one of your motivations was to create a story where uh the central character got the girl or girl got the guy however your your approach is um so how do you kind of keep that dramatic tension there because one of the tricks that they use in television and they use in novels is is uh, is quote always keep them bleeding so the couple never really gets together they're always will they, almost won't they? Yeah. huh the will, will they, they won't they yes will they won't they are they gonna kiss or like any kind of young ya uh show you watch Every time they talk, they look like they're about to kiss, even if they're mm -hmm. just saying hello. And then they walk away and you're like, what's happening? Like, this is not how people interact. But yep. um, 
how do how did you work with that in your in your books? Yeah, that so I I love watching it and I I I never write the stuff like that. I I have always in my own life which has then translated to the characters used the relationship as the the foundation and the safe place. So there is so much else going on that these like these it's the characters against the universe in a lot okay. of ways. So the relationship is in fact the that space where they can be vulnerable and, and have their partner as the supportive, like, yes, we can do this yeah. uh, force rather than th- it being about will they, won't they get together. Gotcha. And there are definitely, so there are uh, in the case of Will and Sarah, there are a number of circumstances that make it difficult for them to be together. So though they want to be together and, and they, they are together, the rest of the the political infrastructure around them um, is trying to keep them apart. So I gotcha. I like that. That's what really, I don't know if you ever saw the show Farscape, but what really drawed me to to Farscape was the two central characters and how much they loved each other, how different they were, but that together they were an incredible couple um, and they felt real. And then everything else was just constantly trying to drive them apart. So I really, I really like that you you can bring in that kind of attention um, and not just kind of let it fall away or, Mm -hmm. or make it to where, where people just are like, come on, just get them together. So it's, it's, I actually think the way that you're doing it is more difficult because it's easy to come up with um, characters that have egos that prevent them from getting together, you know, in, in a Romeo and Juliet way or, or in any other kind of uh, modern way as well. Yeah, um, Will is pretty much constantly on the verge of just having a complete mental and emotional breakdown. And without Sarah, he would. That's so funny. That, that relationship is very important to keep him grounded and doing so, what he has to do. So much like my life. Okay, so um, <laughs> <laughs> so we've got Catacol and that's, that's being um, converted into um, a pilot, correct? Yes, that that was a really amazing experience to work through that adaptation. So uh, James Fox and Daryl Gabonia were the two authors on it. And I worked very closely with them throughout the process. Um, It required me to take a complete step back from the work and and look at it with new eyes. They ended up, because it takes place over so many years, you can't really put that on camera as easily. So, right, right. so they ended up having to merge a few of the timelines together and, and take things that would have happened sequentially and make them parallel to each other. And I think the way that they approached it was absolutely brilliant. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, it sounds very much like what they did in The Witcher. Because when you come to it, like adapting a novel, you almost have to adapt and compress. So you have to um, really say, am I capturing the spirit? of what this novel is trying to say and then work from there because if it's a direct translation it it just it won't work exactly exactly and and that that was very much what we talked about as we were doing it's like this is this is capturing the spirit of the books and but the core of the characters is there the actual way that the events unfold that that's a changeable thing but the the core core heart of it is intact with uh, a screenwriting, you've dipped your toes in it with Catacol. Do you find yourself um, thinking about that more or do you think you're just going to be sticking with building out your expanded universe? I think the expanded universe and my other novel projects will remain my focus, but I really enjoy screenwriting and I have always liked that medium a lot so I, yeah. I would certainly love to continue that exploration and we're talking about a, a couple collaborative side projects that'll oh, probably fun. get underway so I, I I think that there's more of it in my future awesome so what do you have any kind of final tips for anybody out there who is looking at really getting into science fiction and maybe feeling overwhelmed at the moment I think the main thing is to find something that you're really passionate about and and can get excited about because if you are excited as you're writing it then that's going to make the reader excited as they're reading it too that's awesome 
um, there are so many different sub genres in science fiction that if something isn't grabbing you, then just try something else. I mean, from time travel to alternate history to the the space adventure stuff to like near world techno thriller kind of things. It's <laughs> like there's it's it's such a big genre, and there are so many niches in it that just just find your happy place in there and and keep exploring. And then when that thing hits, just go for it. Oh yeah. That's, that's, that's brilliant advice. I always think when you're going to work in a genre like this, I always think be brave, be bold. Mm -hmm. Like if you're going to go for it, go for it. You know, whether it's going to be a subtle piece like Jonathan, or if it's going to be a space faring thing, like, like Catacol or the expanse, Mm -hmm. like really go for it. Um, I believe you host a convention, right? Yes. So I, (laughs) I started one last November and we planned it in about six weeks. It was rather interesting. So there's a very large indie focused writers community called 20 books to 50 K and they host a big in-person gathering every November, but due to the state of the world that was canceled last year and everyone was super, super sad about it. So I, I thought to myself, well, let's have a little gathering just virtually that weekend. Little. Some of us can hang out. And so I was thinking, okay, so maybe we could just do like a catechal con and I'll just have a few readers oh, come cool. and I can talk about stuff. That'd be great. And then I told some of my writer friends about it and it very quickly became this, okay, let's do a full scale online convention in six weeks. <laughs> That's awesome. So coming from a project management background, we, uh, we put that together. And so SIFCON was born, the science fiction and fantasy convention. And that is now going to be an annual thing. We have shifted it to be June as the main one. So the second annual will be taking place the weekend of June 11th to 13th and it is focused on both the creator side and the fan side we have two different tracks that cover that so awesome so virtual this year yes yes we hope to eventually do an in-person gathering of some sort but we will likely continue with a at least online component for the channeling just to maintain accessibility for everyone That's awesome. And full disclosure, I believe I will be on the screenwriting panel. Yes. Yes. We're very excited to have you as a guest this (laughs) year. Yeah, it's going to be cool. I'm actually really looking forward to it because I I love this stuff and I love helping people. And and it sounds like you got a really cool community built around. All right. Any other future transgressions for you, ma'am? I am currently working on the second book in the Terran Empire saga. So be on the lookout for that continuing storyline and In Darkness Dwells, which is a standalone sci-fi horror thriller novel co-authored with James Fox is releasing on Friday the 11th. Oh, James Fox is great. I'm so excited you have him on your, um, on your, on your team. So where can people find your wares? You can use my website as the hub of all things, amyduboff.com. And that'll link you out to Amazon. All my books are on Amazon. A couple of them have book ones that are wide, but I'm in the KDP select program. um, So it's Amazon exclusive for most of it. Yeah. We can find me on Facebook um, under queen of space opera as my, my group name and queen uh, of space opera. Yes. I love it. Uh, and we'll put those links on, on the, uh, the episode info today. That brings us to today's secret code, which is space opera. That is one word, space opera. Make sure you visit the successful screenwriter.com slash podcast to use that secret code and receive five free entries to our giveaway. Amy, I just want to say thank you for being, for being on today. Yeah, thank you so much. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe and share on your social media where you can tag us at The Successful Screenwriter.